when you're a defense counsel to another Marine, I think it's so important that Marines are defended by other Marines because you want that comfort, you want that closeness when you're going through the worst time in your life. Hello, this is Tab Bartley, and you are listening to the Oath We Took podcast, the show that tells the Marine Corps story through the Marines that served. I'm joined today by Kristen Hanna. She is the reason for this podcast. I know so many amazing Marines who hesitate to tell their stories. Their stories hold so much power and so many life lessons. Oftentimes though, their stories go untold. Not every Marine story is the same. What is the same is the oath that we all took. I am absolutely honored today to have on Major Hanna as I know her, or Captain Hanna as I better know her, to share a piece of her story. In today's episode, we talk about her time in service as a lawyer in the Marine Corps, the challenges she faced as a female, and why she chose to get out. Major Hannah is one of the Marines that I look up to the most, and I am so honored to have her on here. This is probably the podcast episode that I, so far, I'm most excited about. Don't tell anybody else, um, (laughs) because... You're one of my favorite people um, and one of my favorite people in the Marine Corps. And so just so everybody who is listening knows, <laughs> Major Hannah, who was Captain Hannah, was my XO on the recruiting station. And uh, this conversation is just going to be amazing. And I'm so excited to have you <laughs> on here. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, sure. You're one of my favorite people in the Marine Corps too. So. I was I was telling Jacob before this, I was like, I'm already getting teary-eyed and I don't even, well, nowadays I get teary-eyed all the time, but I was just like, I was just like, oh, this is such a great conversation and I know it's going to be, and I'm so excited to get to kind of like tell some of your story. So oh, mm. I'm not that interesting. <laughs> no, you are. Uh, so interesting, which we'll start with the first question, which is, I think this is, I'm not sure I've really ever asked you why you decided to join the Marine Corps. So that's going to be the first question is, why did you decide to join the Marine Corps? I was debating what I wanted to do Um, because it was really hard coming out of law school. There weren't a lot of jobs and I always wanted to serve. And so, you know, I was just trying to figure out, hey, how do I want to serve? And I was looking into the different branches and the Marine Corps was the hardest. So clearly that, uh, that spoke to me. So I was like, oh yeah, like, let's do the hardest one, of course. So, and it spoke to me because I didn't need to just be a lawyer, which, you know, because I was on recruiting duty. I didn't get to just be a lawyer. There were the leadership aspects as well, which spoke to me too, you know, and that is why I joined the Marine Corps because honestly, you know, it was the hardest branch and I wanted the hardest. And you saying that, I think anybody that knows you and listens to this completely agrees. Like, yep, that's, yep. That's why she went into the Marine Corps. But can you tell me a little bit about like, how does a lawyer even join the Marine Corps? What was your path as a Marine Corps officer? Because it is such a unique thing. I mean, I think so far on the podcast, I've only had one other officer, which was uh, Captain Whitling. And so he shared <laughs> who, know. who you know. So what was your journey like getting into the Marine Corps? So we had an officer selection officer visit the law school because they specifically look at lawyers because they have a certain number of law contracts. And I only know this because of recruiting duty. (laughs) They have a certain number of law contracts. And I must have been one of those unicorns, right? Because I was a female lawyer. (laughs) So I must have been a unicorn. But the OSO visited the law school. And those poor OSOs, like a lot of times they're not lawyers. So like, talking to law students and trying to appeal to law students must be different, right? And law students, not a lot of people know this, but we come out of there so in debt, right? Like so in debt, a lot of us do, Um, like 200 grand in debt. And 
I know some people have various views on that, but you know, um, so I talked to the OSO and I started, I started working with them. I ran and went and run a PFT. Um, and I was not happy until I had a perfect 300. So I had a perfect 300 all the time. Um, you know how I am. Yeah. (laughs) That wasn't a 300. I need to run that again. So I wasn't required to do PT with them all the way in Tuscaloosa because it was far from my law school. And I was in my last year of law school. Uh, So I wasn't required to PT with them if I kept up my PFT. So I did. Uh, And they weren't worried about it because I kept keeping up my PFT. Um, And then after law school, uh, after the bar, really, uh, so after law school, I took the bar exam, passed the bar exam, and then shipped. So I had a little bit of time from law school taking the bar exam, and then I passed. Thankfully, I knew when I went to OCS that I had passed the bar, so and so at that point, you knew you were going to be a lawyer in the Marine Corps, like yeah. for certain. Yeah, because if you don't pass a bar, you can't. <laughs> you can't. You're not going to be a lawyer. And one of my very good friends, she was a judge advocate in the same platoon I was at in OCS. And she, her state, she didn't find out she passed the bar until she was in OCS. But I remember her getting that letter and it was like a huge relief, but I couldn't imagine with all the stress of OCS having that extra stressor of not even knowing if you're going to be doing the job. Because at that point, you're, I mean, you've, you're going into the Marine Corps, you're going to be doing a job, right? Oh, yeah, you're, you're there. So nowadays, they won't even like for OCC law, they won't even like ship you until you have your bar results now. Which Which, makes sense. Yeah, it definitely does. So, but back when I shipped, they were like, ah, (laughs) you're good. (laughs) We'll figure it out somehow. And and then, so you went to OCS and you were at OCS for how long? And then you went straight to TBS? Yeah. So I was at OCC. So officer, that's Marine Corps talk for... You know, there's like OCC classes and PLC, you know this because you were in recruiting, but PLC, they do it while they're in law school and then they had to go multiple times. Why? Get that done. No. (laughs) So I went OCC. So I went after law school. So I went right from OCS, which was six weeks. That's the most like boot camp, right? Yeah. So most of them screaming at you, doing all, you know, <laughs> yelling at you. It's molding you into becoming a Marine. And then basic school is six months. I went right from OCS to basic school. And that is six months long. Uh, just basically training you to be a basic Marine officer. And then I went right to NJS, what we call NJS, which is our equivalent of the schoolhouse like you had. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> for, but yeah, it's for lawyers in Rhode Island. Very fancy. Oh, yeah. I, now I remember you in Rhode Island. Yeah, super fancy. Because Murphy's Cause made, in Rhode Island. Not too. Yeah, that, that was the same place Murphy went, right? Was the Murphy Station there? Yes. Yeah. 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 And By the you, way, she's almost done with Warren officer. So cool. I've been watching her stuff and I'm just like, what would happen if I just popped up on base? Like where you're going through the course, like snapping, snap my camera. <laughs> Pop up in the way. Hey. Don't uh, mind me. Just here. Here. You're, don't here. mind me. Hi. <laughs> oh gosh. So now I forget, did you meet your husband at OCS or you met him in college? So we went through, uh, I met him in the Marine Corps. In the Marine Corps. Okay. Yeah. I met him. So OCS, you don't really meet people. Well, yeah. Because it's like boot camp. You're just like in it, right? But he and I were the same class. So we were in the same platoon at TBS. Okay. Um, And and I bring, 
Yeah. And I bring that up because I remember one of the conversations that we had had was like you talking to him about like, or you talking about how he could do something at TBS and he would get all this applause or like, good job. You could do the exact same thing. And it wasn't the same like respect or the same, like, you know, it was like, as a female, you had to work triple as hard. And it was a conversation that we had multiple times in the Marine Corps in a, I think a good productive way, mm-hmm. especially like in recruiting while we're meeting young, uh, young females, just like the reality of it is a little different as a female. So can you talk a little bit on that through like TBS and then kind of like your experience with that? So it is. I mean, honestly, you're one of like a couple in your platoon. If that, right? So, and quite honestly, you're carrying the same weight as the dudes. You're, you're, hiking the same amount as the dudes you're doing all the same stuff as the dudes right but I'm five two right however here's the thing about being a female marine and sometimes a female marine officer particularly in TBS we got peer evals right so a lot of time the women are highlighted because there's so few of us And if you complain or if you make yourself an easy target, right, that that sounds weird, but if you make, it'll be a self-fulfilling prophecy, if that makes sense. It does. So whereas some of the men could complain a little bit more, you just highlighted yourself more if you complained. So what I always tried to tell the female Marines under me, um, something that I learned very early on, is if you just buckle down and do your job, you don't have to shut your mouth, right? Because you're not a doormat. You say what you mean and mean what you say, but don't complain. Where does complaining ever get anybody, right? You don't need to complain. You just need to do your job and do it well, and that speaks more than anything else you that complaining can come out of your mouth right so if if you complain and hi, so it it is a little bit different just because you are like we call ourselves if you are the prouder but if you if you hold yourself with respect and you do your job and you do your job well you will get respect you will yeah. get the, the respect that you deserve right yeah and I think it's, it's important though, to have that conversation, right? Like, because I think that's where as female Marines, one, there's so few of us, like it's, it's hard to even like have that, like honest conversation of yes, are there differences? Like there are like differences, however, in doing the same thing or doing this, you can get that respect. And like you said, like you, you're not a doormat, you can be vocal, um, that's something I really looked up to you was that like, you were very much yourself. You were very much like, you you know, you said it, it wasn't that you just like did whatever um, and you did the job well. And that's what allowed you to be able to do that. But I just, it was a conversation I feel like we had had multiple times um, in, in our time together. And it was just, I remember you telling telling us that. And then also that you guys got engaged at the Marine Corps Museum, right? <laughs> yes, it's very motivated, isn't it? Very motivated. Yes, it we is. got engaged at the Marine Corps Museum. Probably the most moto um, engagement story I know. <laughs> you know, we're just so moto. But Bartley, honestly, and I, I will call you Bartley probably till we die. Um Honestly, though, you portrayed that as well because you were a corporal in what should have been a gunny's billet in at the recruiting station. So you were a corporal dealing with gunnies and staff sergeants and and sergeants sometimes, but more like staff sergeants and gunnies and even mass sergeants. And you held your own. And that is something for a junior Marine to do. You had a one person shop, you were it. And you you ran it and people respected you for it. And they came to you for advice because they knew you knew what you were doing. 
And that is a huge thing. And your competence spoke volumes. So it's, that's an important thing in the Marine Corps. And especially as a female Marine, if you show you're competent and you're put together and you can do your job, uh, people will come to you. And I think like what's important of that too is I was able to do my job because I had leaders like you, like Major Nash, like Captain Whitling, who allowed me to do my job, right? Because as you know, even just like in our district, but as a whole recruiting duty, the MPAs a lot of times can't do things, not because they actually can't, but because their command has whatever perceptions of them or that job or what have you. So it's definitely like, I, I mean, I feel like I did a lot, but I also like the reality of it is I was able to, because I had a command that allowed me to, if, if that makes, makes sense. And I, um, bring it back to you and your leadership style was like, again, I say like, you're one of my favorite Marines, but it's because of like how good of a leader you are. And so can you tell me a little bit about like your journey in the Marine Corps and how you developed your leadership and, and maybe a part of your career where you really felt like you understood what your leadership style was and, and how you would lead? Well, so here's the thing about TBS and I'll, I'll also take it back to the Bible. Servant leadership is a huge thing in the Marine Corps and in the Bible, right? Um, Ductus exemplo is the motto of TBS, lead by example, right? The most important thing I think about being a Marine is officer, and the thing that struck a chord with me is officers are trained by enlisted personnel. We are the only branch that does this, and it is so important. It's the most important thing that we do, because you know what? You will never lead if your Marines don't respect you. You will never lead if they don't respect you. And how do you, how do you gain that respect? By doing what you say you're going to do and allowing them to do what they need to do. So it's not micromanaging, right? And it's getting in there and doing it with them. If Marines see you get in there and bust your, your tuchus, they will follow you to the ends, right? And it says, it's, it says that in the Bible too, not took us, but it says, you know, Jesus was a servant leader too. And, and we Marines strive, strive to be like that. And sometimes in the Marine Corps, you can get some micromanagement, which is, you know, but that's in every organization. And if you just knuckle down with your Marines, you'll, you'll get, you'll get the leadership that you want. So what was your either favorite duty assignment and, or like favorite, like time in the Marine Corps? I honestly, recruiting duty would have to be up there. I know it's very hard and very challenging. Um, I also love my time as a trial counsel and defense counsel, but that's also a very trying time. So both in the courtroom and recruiting duty were my favorites. And those were very demanding, but it allows you to like get in there with the Marines and, and do something. My, my favorite was as a defense counsel because it's Marines defending Marines, right? And you got to get in there with the client and get personal, but also recruiting duty. You know, you got to know your recruiters and you're working with them six days a week, you know, if not more. I was about and, to say, if not seven. <laughs> it, and you were there and you were with them. I mean, that comes with a certain amount of sacrifice. And, and when you sacrifice with people, you stay with those people. And I, so 
one of the things I love talking about when we were on one of our like, you know, millions of drives somewhere was like your philosophy on like why you wanted to be a defense attorney to Marines and like the impact it had on you. And I don't, I don't want to lead you to the answer, but you used to always say that there was a reason to why you loved being a defense attorney for Marines. Um, Nobody and- talks like Marines do. Yeah. No, nobody understands Marines the way other Marines do. I know that sounds very egotistical and like very like, I don't know, but we're, you know, we're a special breed. And if like, and here's the thing, you, you talk about respect, right? People who have earned the EGA understand people who have earned the EGA. And when you're a defense counsel to another Marine, I think it's so important that Marines are defended by other Marines because you want that comfort. You want that closeness when you're going through the worst time in your life, you know, and those are people who have earned the EGA. Yeah, they may have messed up, but they deserve the constitutional right to defense counsel, just like everybody else. And they deserve a great counsel. But the reason why the Marine Corps has never given over to the Navy lawyers is I asked somebody once, I was like, because we were, no, no disrespect to the Navy, right? But I love them. And you're married to one. (laughs) So no disrespect to the Navy, but here's the thing. Is it easier talking to a Marine as a Marine or is it easier talking to a Navy person? And I asked my boss that one time because he he said, well, why can't the Marine Corps just use Navy? I was like, let me tell you something. Who do you enjoy talking to more? Me or them? He's like, point made. I'm like, because Marines feel comfortable with other Marines. And like you they said, know they've been through it, right? Yeah. And like you said, like literally the worst time in their life. Like they, yeah. this is probably like, this is the low and whatever it may mean and whatever, like the pivotal, I just think of like the impact of knowing that it's another Marine fighting for you and your best interest. And like, just what that could potentially do, just having that person in that role, not even like what the results are, but knowing that like, you've always have a Marine there for you. Like there's just something with that, right? Because that's what we're taught that we're always going to have each other's backs and so on and so forth. And there just has to be, that has to have such an impact. And have someone in your, in your corner, right? Have someone who is just truly there for you, right? And yes, it's an all consuming job, but it's kind of supposed to be you know, and you, and the Marine that you're defending deserves that. And I don't know, that's just the way I see it. And the, yeah, yeah. And the same for recruiting duty, you know, you, the, the kids, I call them kids, but like the police going in deserve everything that you got. Uh, because, and, you know, because you're the face of the Marine Corps to them and that's huge. And so going in, they have to know that they can trust and, and be trusted. And that's big. Yeah. And then especially like when our area had so many areas that like had never met Marines before. Right. So literally that one recruiter, that is that, that person for that entire area represents everything for the Marine Corps. Yeah. Like it's wild. Yes. Which is why I always told the recruiters and this was not legal advice. So I can say this, right. I was XO. I was not acting as counsel. So I have to give my little legal disclaimer. It was not legal advice. So what, what I would always tell the recruiters is you better understand that this, it can kind of be a solo duty, but you should be representing the Marine Corps appropriately. You do not do stuff that you would not do on base or in the fleet Marine Corps. 
you know, I guess we don't call it that anymore, but in the fleet, you would, you, the easiest, like, do not get yourself in trouble because you are the face of the Marine Corps to those kids. Yeah, which uh, I, I loved recruiting duty as well. I, I mean, I was only there in at Quantico, so um, I don't have a lot to judge it off of, but I yes, loved recruiting. Do. <laughs> yes, you do. I, I loved recruiting duty. It was so cool to, you know, go out in schools and stuff. And like, it was cool as if I loved when we both went somewhere together or like when we went and like Murphy was there too, or, you know, yes. Staff Sergeant Whitfield, or like, it just like to have like, multiple female marines and then like enlisted and officer and then like senior enlisted was just such a cool thing to to see people even though we constant people constantly thought we were like JRTC students which was awkward <laughs> <laughs> or when I was pregnant and in those gross pregnancy uniforms and people didn't want to put me in photos I'm like no don't take my photos Ugh. and they were like who are you I remember like getting asked like who who are you what what branch are you with Marine Corps <laughs> if anybody is listening I need you to fix the maternity uniforms fix the maternity please. Yes, please. please yes please no but what's great because when I was at Quantico right because I just I just came off Quantico a little bit ago I guess it was a little bit ago August I just came off active duty um and I saw soon to be warrant officer you know Murphy there and we were doing PFTs and you see you see people that and you're just like oh I know you and I got to go and you took photos at one of our old you know recruiter slash oh. cool program specialist yes and ceremony it's that's I my favorite thing about the Marine Corps, like for certain is the people and like the relationships. Like, I just don't think anything will like match that. I mean, and becoming a Marine, like you said, like the EGA just like holds such a like, yeah. Um, but you got out. And so let's talk a little yeah. bit about that because you, you had multiple duties that, like you said earlier, were just like almost all encompassing. And yes. And my last one was too. My last one was a six day a week job. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about that and trying to raise a family and be a wife and be there for your kids and, and managing that? Like it's hard being it's a hard. and leading. Yeah. Yes, it is. So my last job, I was the head of officer promotions. So I ran officer promotion boards. They're run by a lawyer. Uh, for the Marine Corps because they're title 10 boards and it was a six day a week job um, and it was it was a great job I really enjoyed it um, and I really enjoyed doing the boards and doing all that uh, but yes it does come at a sacrifice to your family so I was, I always told my husband right you know and and my family hey if this ever gets too much tell me, right? Because you do move every three years. And it is because it's not just a nine to five job. It's not. It's a lot of weekends. It's a lot of it. You know, you also have to PT and keep up with your PT it's physical training for the civilians watching that. Um, you got to keep up with your PT. You got to keep up with it. And so like, it just, it, it becomes something, right? And so I always told my family, hey, if this ever gets too much, right? Just, just tell me. And then the, it, it, it did, right? So it, I now have four kids, right? And I know you do too. And so it just, it got to be a lot, a lot, a lot. And <clears throat> so I had orders to school. I had orders to the schoolhouse to get my LLM for the Marine Corps. And I knew if I took those orders to school that I would have a payback tour, right? So, and I was in 11 years at that point. So if I went to school for a year and then did a payback tour, I would have been in 15. And then why, why get out? 
at that yeah. point when you're five years from retirement. So it was just time. Um, was it an easy decision? No. Because a lot of your identity gets wrapped up in the Marine Corps, which is why it's really hard for Marines to come out. And then when you leave, it's extremely difficult because you feel like you've lobbed off a piece of yourself. And you go from talking to people every day to not as often. And you go from wearing a uniform to people not knowing you, if that makes sense. It does because it does feel like such a part of you. Like somebody being a Marine just like means something. You understand what it means. So then to not wear that. And then as a female to like, you know, if you have a Marine Corps sticker or something like that, like, oh, your oh, husband like served. Your husband oh, served. your which I mean, okay, for both of us, our husbands did, but like Jacob, you know, yeah. is always like, I'm not the Marine. And it's just like, why, like, at least for me, I never felt like I really had to validate myself in the Marine Corps. And all of a sudden when I got out, I did. And my gender mattered so much when I got out. And I didn't really feel that in the Marine Corps. Actually, like on recruiting duty, it felt like a positive because it was like, hey, let's yeah. show female Marine to our school. Yeah. How was that transition for you now that you've gone through it? So it's interesting. And it's also interesting being a lawyer, Bartley, because you go from being a generalist in the Marine Corps, like you do everything, right? Um, to going to the Civilian Legal Society. And they're so specialized and like looking for jobs is like, <gasps> you know? Because you're like, I have 11 years of worth of experience and, it, and then certain states want you to take the bar, but you're 11 years out. I don't want to take that test with four kids. You, you know, it almost gave me an ulcer the first time I took it. I, went, I mean, I'll take it if it's necessary, but the transition has been hard because you kind of have to find a new identity, right? I mean, you still have your identity as mom, um, you know, and you still have your identity. Like I'm, I'm a huge believer in, in Jesus and you still have that identity, but yeah, like you say, you go to, <laughs> you go to the grocery store and you see a Marine who has like a shirt on and you're like, oh, I like your shirt. And they're like, oh, okay. And you're like, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this was weird, you know, but. No, it's been, it's been a difficult transition because if you ask my husband, like I, I made a deal with him. I'd take some time off, which if anybody knows me, that is so hard. That was the hardest thing for me because I kept looking for jobs. I believe it. I believe and it. I, I would do interviews and I'm like, <laughs> and I was just like, my husband's like, stop. So I, I took some time off. I, I spent it with the kids. Right. And it was so hard for me because I'm such a, like, you know, you've met me. Mm -hmm. I'm borderline lunatic with the work. I have to be engaged. I have to be in it. Right. And if other people are working, I better be. <laughs> Not that be not that being home with the kid being home with the kids is the hardest job I've ever had. Let me just I've been a Marine Corps officer. Being home with the kids is the hardest job I've ever had. I'm just telling you. Um, for all the stay at home moms out there, I tell you what, what you do is not underrated. It is hard. But yeah, I'm going back to work in August and it'll be it'll be different because it's a lot different than what I did in the Marine Corps. I'll be teaching moot court, right? And so I don't know, it's just, it's just different. You, I kind of took a step back. There's other reasons, right? My mom passed away my last year in the Marine Corps and that shook my world, shook my world. 
Um, and that was another impetus of getting out, right? Um, and I learned, hey, work will always be there, right? So just be with your family. So the teaching job is, is a good way to be with my family and also kind of create the balance. You and I both know work-life balance can be sort of a fallacy, right? But I've, I've tried to find, I've tried to figure out a way to make it better. Which one of my fears too, and I don't know if you've had the same fear. I didn't know if like, because my personality is so like assertive and like the Marine Corps, like Marine Corps and me vibed, right? Like my personality vibed with the Marine Corps. I feel like yours the same way. Like you can be completely you. Part of my fear was that the civilian sector couldn't handle that. Is that a fear that you've had at all that like? I'm very blunt. Well, so are you, but I'm very blunt (laughs) and very in your face and very loud, which you know, you've met me. And, you know, I am, I mean, yeah, the Marine Corps and I work together in that regard, right? It was. And <laughs> I am very honest, but sometimes to a fault, right? Like, too honest. <laughs> like, let's have in some tact, Major Hannah, please. Um, or learn to couch it in a more respectful manner. But um, no, I worry about that, right? Like, I, I do worry about that. And quite honestly, I haven't been in the civilian working environment enough to know if that's going to be an issue. But that is something that I worry about because I am a particular flavor, right? I, I will say I have been pleasant although it was like something that feared me I have been pleasantly surprised that I as I look back on like where I've been it was me holding back and the fear of that that created more like not issues but me feeling like I couldn't be myself you know caused like yeah, not issues but like it caused me mental like health yeah. issues that yeah. then when I started to like just open up it was like oh they they, nobody I can cares. be myself. Yeah, nobody, <laughs> nobody cares. actually cares. And it was just like, oh, I could have done this like 10 months ago. I could have done this. Before. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think I'm just old enough to that I'm like, well, take me or leave me. This is, you know, what God, God made me. Yeah, I need to curb some things, right? <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I, uh, no, I, I've definitely been like, okay, well, you know, I'll be somebody's flavor. <laughs> For sure. And I like, again, I I look up to you so much and like, I, I felt so blessed that like, I was able to have you as my executive officer and, you know, a strong female officer, you know, going through life and doing things and just being so respected and could see how much other people respected you. What advice do you have to those young female Marines or really any Marines in general in like their career and their personalities and like, kind of like their place in the Marine Corps? Be authentic and work hard and don't do stupid stuff because you think it's going to make you more likable. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Like, don't do stupid stuff just because you think it's going to make you more popular. Like, this is a job. It's not a popularity contest. People like people who, it's the same in the Marine Corps. People like people who are authentic, who are going to do what they say they're going to do right? And work hard. Really, that's it. And don't do stupid stuff. (laughs) (laughs) You know exactly what I'm talking about. Like, and I feel like sometimes Marines are at a disservice, especially, you know, enlisted Marines who come in when they're 18. And they're like, still, still working on the stupid stuff part. Some of them, I mean, officers do stupid stuff all the time. Don't get me wrong. We can all do stupid stuff. But like, 
18 year olds sometimes still get a flavor. Like I need to care what, you know, obviously you need to care what others think about you, but don't do stupid stuff thinking that you're cool because cool wears off and nobody really cares. People care about those who work hard and do what they say they're going to do. You're not cool because you're ro- rolling in, you know, smelling funky with no haircut for the guys, right? Or like getting this big tattoo out of rags. Like, don't do that crap. Don't do that. Don't do that. But, you know, work hard, do what you say you're going to do and just be, be authentic. Is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you would like to talk about? One of the biggest things that I think about being a Marine vice, a civilian job is we do get all up in your business, the leadership it's called intrusive, <laughs> intrusive leadership. We get it all up in your business, but we are supposed to. I think good leaders do that. Um, and you're doing it wrong if you don't. Um, and don't be afraid to share with your leadership the hard things that you're going through, right? Now, we also have, I mean, everybody's had bad leaders who are not the best at handling those things, but there really are. Most people join the Marine Corps who care, who care. So if you're going through hard stuff, if you're going through things, share that. Because if your leadership knows, you have people in your corner helping you. You know, no one got through the Marine Corps alone at all. Up and down the chain of command, there are people who have helped me, right? All throughout. So if if you share things with your leadership, that'll only make it better. Yeah. And I can't even count the amount of times I came into your office, whether it was to I say word vomit because I don't like to say complain word vomit or whatever. And that it was just like, partly, what do you need to do? How do you how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Or I always think back to an incident where, again, I was the most junior Marine in the command and somebody who was way higher ranking felt some type of way about something I had posted to social media and I was just like, I know what I did wasn't wrong. Like, I know it wasn't like I'm standing my ground. And I went into your office expecting like, damn, I'm going to get, I just got my ass chewed from this other individual. And now I'm about to just like, I mean, like rip the bandaid off. And it was just like, Bartley, you're good. I heard it. And it was just like, oh, like just those moments again of like not being alone or there's so many times in my career. And I think that's why I struggled so much when I got out, because whenever I went to somebody, because I had an issue, I never went through things alone. Yeah, you never go through things alone. And it's important to know that somebody has your back. And that's the biggest thing for leaders to do inside or outside the Marine Corps is have the people under them's back because it, well, I mean, they're always going to be wrong in certain situations and, and you have to counsel them just like you would, right? You counsel them and then you build them back up. But if they're right, and then they're right, and then it's done. And then the thing as a leader is taking the face shots for your Marines. You take the face shots, because who cares? I got face shots (laughs) all the time, but you never let your Marines see and you never let that stuff roll downhill. And that's why you're such a good leader. And that's because, why. It, because it's got, if you're a good leader, you take the face shots for them. Because those are your people. They acted under your direction, you know, and it is what it is. And 
everybody in the Marine Corps gets yelled at. Who cares? Right. That's what, that's one of the things when I came in the civilian world, I was like, I will take an ass chewing all day because trust <laughs> me, I had way worse in the Marine Corps. <laughs> way worse. Worse. Way worse. But you never let the stuff, you let it roll off your back and you move forward. And that's some of the best stuff that I've learned from the best leaders that I know. And that's something that you did very well. You never let it affect other things. You compartmentalize, you say, okay, they can yell at me. You yell at me. And then you go about your business. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I am so glad you agreed to come on this podcast. And I have one final question for you, which is if you had to take the oath again, would you? Well, I'm going to do one of my noises because I know you miss those. <laughs> I know you miss them. Um, absolutely, I would. I mean, I got my family from it. Some of the best people I know are in the Marine Corps. My friends to this day are in the Marine Corps. You know, it built me into somebody that, you know, it, it's, it's good. I think I'm pretty good. <laughs> But no, it seriously, it, it made me a good leader and it allowed, honestly, what I said when I was leaving the Marine Corps and I didn't know they were going to do the ceremony this day or else I would have invited you, right? Because we were in the same area. I didn't know they were going to do it at this time because sometimes in the Marine Corps, we're not the best at telling people things you know, or yeah. sometimes things just happen, right? That that happens. But one of the things that I told the junior Marines that are still there is the reason that I joined the Marine Corps was still the same reason when I left the junior Marines. Because they are the best you will ever find. And it is such a privilege to know them and to serve with them and to do the heavy lifting with them. And that is why I would take the oath again in a heartbeat is those junior Marines. I love them. This is the Oath We Took podcast and you just heard a piece of Major Hannah's story. You now know one more Marine and one more piece of Marine Corps history. Her sacrifices matter. Her stories matter. Not every Marine story is the same. We didn't all join the Marine Corps for the same reason. What is the same is the oath that we all took. An oath that easily could have ended in death, and for some, it did. So listeners, instead of asking you to thank a Marine for their service, I'm gonna challenge you to continue to listen to their stories instead. <laughs>